I'm Alistair Stevens. I'm Elizabeth Ray. And Tom Cruise is Roy Miller and Matthew Knight in Night and Day. otherwise a ridiculous title it is a very like, ridiculous title you have title. to really want it and you don't get to the last name night until like 45 minutes into the film and you don't get to day Ever. at all Ever. like you kind of yeah you just have to to build your own pyramid of explanation <laughs> in order to justify this somewhat lackluster title <laughs> Night and someday. Night and someday, right? right? That is that is the joke. That is what That's, you're building toward. That's uh. the only possible interpretation. <laughs> would it have killed them to make you the surname day? Like, would it really have hurt? So would that weird. Have ruined the waiting. intellectual coherence at the heart right? of this film. I was waiting for a reveal that she was not who she said she was, and she was, you know, spy of someone whose last name was Day, and no. Which we kind of get in as much as she can suddenly spy at the end of the movie. She all can at once. suddenly spy. She's all at spy once she capable. She went, to, she went to spy school. Secret spy college. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> While he was unconscious in a yeah. weird montage at the end of the film. Anyway, you guys, welcome to The Last Star in Hollywood. This week, Night and Day from yeah. 2008. I want to situate this in its proper historical context so that we can try and make sense of what is going on because perhaps the most surprising thing about Night and Day is how much Tom Cruise wants to do this film, which is Ooh. bewildering because for all that this is a ramshackle film with frequent high points, right? That, yes, that is the story of this so. film. This yes. film is occasionally, even frequently, brilliant. It is extremely stupid and funny and anarchic. It doesn't really add up to anything, but I can't right. imagine what he saw on the page and thought, yes, that's the project for me. This is happening while Valkyrie is in post-production, right? This is the middle of 2008, and Cruz is already looking ahead to his next projects, assuming that that long-awaited Oscar is now in the bag for his performance oh, in Valkyrie. Yeah. Lions for Lambs hasn't worked out. Tropic Thunder has just come out. He's experiencing a little bit of interest in whatever the next phase of his career mm -hmm. will be. And he's involved in two projects. The first is Salt, a story about a Russian sleeper agent who goes on the run, so more spy shenanigans. And the mm -hmm. other is The Tourist, in which he's supposed to play opposite Charlize Theron in a story of an American tourist who's caught up in this plot with this beautiful, mysterious stranger. That's also the one that turns into Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie? That's the amazing thing, is that Angelina Jolie appears in both of those projects after Cruz oh, steps right. away. Oh, that's right. Salt is her too. Because Salt is gender flipped. It's one of the most interesting development stories in Whoa. the history of Hollywood. They just flip the gender of the protagonist. And yeah, it's, it's Angelina Jolie and, you're right, Angelina Jolie and Johnny Depp in the very bad but occasionally kind of sexy because of Jolie, not because of Depp. Agreed. The yes. Tourist, which has at least some really beautiful cinematography. I basically only remember how extremely good her costuming is Absolutely. in that movie. So That's the only impression it left on me. That story, that film, that script is being developed actively with Cruz and Theron in mind. In fact, Cruz is so in on The I Tourist see that. that he dispatches Christopher McQuarrie, his new favorite writer in the world, to go and put a little polish on the script to make it everything that it can be. Then he comes across this script. He's actually sent this script for Night and Day by Cameron Diaz. She is the one that's already attached. Cute. She sends him the script and he drops everything to commit to this project, which is wild. Yeah. I think that on paper, either Salt or The Tourist is a better fit for Cruise. Hmm. And this is just a weird kind of halfway house between his spy persona and his action persona and yeah. doesn't really resolve into either. It's also a weird swing at comedy. James Mangold, the director of this film, talks a lot about how, you know, no one gives Cruz the chance to be funny anymore. And sir, I've just been through his entire filmography and I can tell you that no one ever really gave Cruz the chance to be funny. Like that, that is not a part of his movie star persona that we lean on very heavily. No. And this is the product. This is what falls out of this incredibly ramshackle production that I cannot wait to talk about. But first, Elizabeth, <laughs> could you encapsulate this entire film in 20 to 30 seconds and in Absolutely improvised basis? <laughs> it's the trailer game. From the actors who brought you Vanilla Sky and Mission Impossible 2 comes a new film with the weaknesses of both. <laughs> what even is time and who can remember? How many guns and explosions can we get in one film? 
How many civilian casualties will we ignore? How frantic can Cameron Diaz and Tom Cruise be in a car together? She's the cute girl you bump into in the airport. He's the super spy who will continually drug and undress you. See Cameron Diaz and Tom Cruise in Night and Day. See, I think this is exactly the problem. What's that? You really like Night and Day. You had a great time I... watching it. But as soon as you start to talk about this film... It falls apart. You have to be critical. It, yeah. it forces you to 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 pull it apart and, and to find the legion of flaws contained yeah. therein. But if you can just leave it alone, if you can this is where it defeats the very purpose and intent of this podcast. I think. <laughs> this is art that defies interpretation. <laughs> because as soon as you even think about it critically for a second, it deflates. Yeah. It deflates like an abused souffle. And not thinking about it lets you preserve this memory of this very <laughs> stupid but ultimately kind of fun kind film. Kind of fun though, right? Yeah. I even thought kind of sexy. In like, parts. In parts. Weirdly kind of sexy. Yeah. Yes. I think that when she's all like, oh, you don't seem happy to see me with her little truth serum and she's so giggly and cute. And then he walks over to kiss her. I was like, ooh, ooh. That is such that a weird shot. quite hot actually. Suddenly he's not afraid of bullets anymore. So that's good too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, a really variable threat in this film anyway, depending on your circumstances so and true. how high up the call sheet you are. <laughs> Let's talk about the development of this film because this is a wild one. This really is the story of, of a film that was touched by every single pair of hands in Hollywood and almost none of them left a real mark. It's conceived around 2002 as an R-rated thriller called All New Enemies, written by former actor and first-time screenwriter Patrick O'Neill. He sells mm. that script in 2004 to Revolution Studios, who hesitate. They get a little bit of cold feet. They, they start to rework the script. They transform it into an Adam Sandler vehicle called Wichita. Revolution then folds in 2007, and the project is inherited by Sony Pictures. Sandler drops out. The script is reworked again into an action romance called Trouble Man, starring Chris Tucker and Ava Mendez, which oh my God. at least sounds like it could be fun for sure. Sony then gets cold feet and drops the movie completely. The project bounces to 20th Century Fox. The Chris Tucker rewrite is basically scraped off and thrown mm -hmm. into the trash. And the now untitled Wichita project, Fox gives to Scott Frank, who had previously adapted Minority Report and written Steven Soderbergh's out of Sight, based on the Elmore Leonard novel. That's a hot movie. That is a very hot movie. This version of the script is seen by Cameron Diaz, who likes it enough to persuade Fox to hand it off to Dana Fox, the writer, who had just worked on her movie with Ashton Kutcher, What Happens in Vegas. Dana Fox takes a swing at a more romantic version of the story, and that's the version that's handed by the studio to director James Mangold early in 2009. Diaz takes that script to Tom Cruise, who signs up in May of 2009, but the script isn't done yet. It goes to Lita Caligridis, who had written on Alexander for Oliver Stone. It then goes to Ted and Nicholas Griffin. Ted had previously written on Ocean's Eleven. Then Don Payne, a producer on The Simpsons and a writer of My Super Ex-Girlfriend. Actor and writer Timothy Dowling takes a swing at it, who hadn't really written much of anything at the time, but would go on to write the absolutely dreadful Pixels for Adam Sandler in the years to come. Simon Kinberg, who wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith, perhaps sure. the most direct connection here. And then finally, the script gets bounced back to Scott Frank, whose job it is to take all of these different drafts and somehow fit them together into one film, which is why this film feels like a patchwork of the best ideas of 12 different writers. Yeah. Who got the actual writing credit? Patrick O'Neill. Patrick O'Neill. WGA rules say that Patrick O'Neill, because he basically did sketch the entirety of the plot okay. and all of the subsequent drafts were tweaking in one direction or another, yeah. he gets the sole writing credit. That is but so 12 wild. 12 known writers, yeah. and who knows how many other rewrites came in. 12 known writers worked on the script before it hit the set, and then James Mangold threw out fully a third of it and rewrote it on the fly on the day of shooting. Uh-oh. Which is why this film feels like a disaster a happening in camel. slow motion. Oh, yeah, yeah. We cannot pin down a tone. We cannot pin down a <laughs> style. We cannot pin down characterization. Yeah. Our characters morph and flit from one form to another between scenes. Yeah. There's no overriding structure at all. Did I mention that it's kind of fun? Did I mention that it's kind of fun? It I, I really is kind of fun, to, though. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Because again, as soon as you really try and look at it, it starts to hurt you in your heart. Aww. 
it's a really, I have never seen such a chimeric beast as this. I've mm. never seen such an ill-fitting collection of mostly good comedic bits, like mostly good, well-intentioned, fun, at least superficially fun bits mm. of, of, you know, comedic spycraft on yeah. screen. Yeah. To me, it's just way, way, way too many guns. There's just yes. too much shooting. That part is not funny to me. Uh, but uh, but the, the like rom-com bits, I think, are good. I think Paul Dano's funny. Like his. Is this the best that Paul Dano's ever been? I really, I think that I like Paul Dano. I haven't seen him do very many things, okay. but I, I genuinely like him I most really of the time. I really like the way that he vanishes into this performance in a way yeah. that I find that Paul Dano does not normally vanish into a role mm, for me. He's sure. quite a conspicuous actor. Actually, I will say this. I want to give full credit to three people who knocked it out of the park, who did as good a job on this film as I have literally ever seen in my in my long life watching movies. I want to credit Lisa Beach, Donna DeSada, and Sarah Katzman, who were the casting directors on this film, oh. and who absolutely nailed it. Every single actor is in exactly the right spot. Hmm. They hired the perfect performer for every role, no matter how deep you go into this list. Yeah. It's absolutely That's true. That's a great point. I mean, it's a lot of fairly obvious first thought kind of hires, right? Mm -hmm. We need someone who can be like a functional, stern, intimidating villain, but who is principled enough that you'll believe the hero turn at the end. Let's get Viola Davis. Like, of course, that's who you get for that role. She's played that role 17 yeah, times. We need someone it. who is sleazy and who we're not ever really going to trust, even when he's presenting himself <laughs> as being in the right. Well, Peter Sarsgaard, of course you hire Peter Sarsgaard for that. Yeah. We need an ineffectual dope who we're not going to mind when he gets shot by Tom Cruise. You hire Riley Finn from season four of Buffy. <laughs> you hire Mark Lucas. That's what he's for. We can give him a shitty mustache. Excellent. <laughs> High fives all around. I genuinely think that the casting in this film is is out of the park good. Wow. Don't you? I think, yeah. No, I think you're right. I hadn't really thought about it. But we were talking earlier about how Gal Gadot is such a great <laughs> like addition to the film. When like, she walks in, it's basically a special effect. Absolutely yes. perfect. Like, hi, I'm the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. Like, wow, you are. Yeah. yeah. You are. <laughs> it's really, well, and I think Dano falls into that category too. I think that this performance is such a perfect use of his weird squirrely energy i think yeah. it, it really really fits and i don't know who the guy is who's on the train pretending to be him and then turns out to have like you know a russian accent or something but he was cool too that is the german actor folk hetchel mm. who has basically played this role in many many films. sure yes. sure maybe it was like an austrian accent they were in austria at the time i don't even remember i just remember that it, it was that sudden turn oh i'm not who i said i was and yeah. anyway he was cute i thought his ordering a harvey wallbanger <laughs> who orders a harvey wallbanger <laughs> past Again, 1974 that is someone's pet idea that survived through the various revisions of this script someone thought that was funny or maybe that was at some point like actually structural maybe that was going to be an echo of an earlier scene i don't know that is now lost to the sands of time uh folk henschel's known for on imdb is night and day transcendence the uh, Johnny Depp movie, White House Down, and apparently one episode of Arrow where he appeared as Carter Hall. That's Hawkman from the Ooh. DC continuity. Okay, cool. Yeah. He's great, though. And he's only 5'11", which is Ooh. surprising because I feel like he's so much bigger he's than Cameron really Diaz in that scene. Big on but that then, train. in this movie more than most movies, how tall is anyone? <laughs> It changes from scene to say. scene, from yeah. moment to moment. There's, it all depends whether Tom Cruise is carrying his apple box around with him or not. I just remember that he ultimately gets sucked out of the train window, hanging onto sausages before another train. Is before <laughs> another train scrapes him clean. Yes. I don't know why that wouldn't just live in your mind constantly. Are you not always thinking about that now? I guess a little the bit. Sausages, Elizabeth. <laughs> Let's talk a little about the director of this film, James Mangold. He's such an interesting director, actually, because he starts out as a writer-director who's very interested in big, important subjects. He wants to make, like, important films. He winds up directing the fifth Indiana Jones sequel. <laughs> like, Whoa. the arc of his career is crazy. He gets his break with the independent movie Heavy, starring Liv Tyler in 1995, but really steps up with Copland in 1997, starring Sylvester Stallone and Harvey Keitel, and of course, De Niro in that film too. He then does Girl Interrupted in 1999. Oh, he does shit. Kate and okay. Leopold in 2001. He does Identity in 2003. He does the fantastic Johnny Cash biopic Walk the Line in 2005. Oh my God. 310 to Yuma in 2007. Yeah. Like these are 
big idea yeah. movies and he's making them like clockwork this is every two years he comes out with a new film that is at least swinging for the fences but he gets a little disillusioned there's a real stumble in his career he decides at this point that he wants to make something more commercial because 310 to yuma really failed to make an impression with the academy that was really a mm. swing for him and the academy did not care so much for that movie so he decides well screw it i'm, I'm just going to make something commercial and he signs on to do night and day wanting to do something lighter something more improvisational believing that the world was tired of seeing tom cruise be edgy and angsty and wanted him to be sunnier wanted to restore some part of that risky That's business energy is he is, sunny in this i think so I, I think some versions of him are it's so weird that I keep seeing Risky Business in this movie, in yeah. his performance. I keep seeing that character. And that's, yeah, not huh. a version of Cruz that we see very often, particularly by the time we hit the 21st century. Yeah. To me, he's got this, like, it's that secret behind the eyes thing that's happening. Like, that's that mystery behind the twinkle that is really sure. working for me. And I don't feel like I've seen before. It Interesting. feels like a different role for Cruz, for me. Yes. And I think I like it. For all that there's, you know, if you're standing far enough back from this film, you can assume that it's going to play much like Mission Impossible, that it's just going to yeah. be an exaggerated Mission Impossible. But this is a completely different character for Cruz, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mangold will move on from Night and Day and work on The Wolverine and then on Logan, then on Ford versus Ferrari, which is at least oh. a big swing idea. That's mm -hmm. a great movie. And then, yeah, ultimately... Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. God. What's fantastic is that if you go to James Mangold's Wikipedia page, the link to this is in the show notes, and I encourage everyone listening to the sound of my voice right now to actually do this. Go to his Wikipedia page where you can read about his entire career, except for one notable film. This is a direct quote from his Wikipedia page. In 2007, Mangold directed the Western 310 to Yuma, starring Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. It received positive reviews and grossed around 71 million worldwide. In June 2011, Mangold was hired initially just to direct the X-Men movie The Wolverine. That is how much of an impression Night and Day made. It <laughs> isn't even completely. mentioned. No yeah. reference to it at all, despite it being not a huge commercial success, but commercially justified, at mm. least, and a Tom Cruise Cameron Diaz movie when, yeah. admittedly, neither one of them is at the height of their power. But sure. still, they are big names. They will get a certain amount of attention no matter what. It's the marketing, ultimately, that sinks this movie. Really? They try to make it cool. They try to make it edgy. They try to make it stylish. Uh. They are constantly presenting it as a original adult franchise. Th those are the words that are used by the marketing department the whole time. It is an original adult franchise, which is insane. A, uh -huh. you don't get to decide if it's a franchise yeah, when you're yeah, making one absolutely. movie, sir. Yeah. And leaning on its originality feels a little tenuous. And also it's adultness. This is a PG-13. Cameron Diaz say. gets one very conspicuous fuck yeah. so that it is a PG-13 and not just a PG movie, which it could honestly be. Yeah, yeah. This could be, you know, an all ages Spy Kids type affair <laughs> with very few edits. Yeah. <laughs> So let's talk a little about Cameron Diaz. We're catching up with her now. We talked about the first part of her life, obviously, back in Vanilla Sky. Since then, she appeared in Gangs of New York. She cameoed in yeah. Minority Report, if you remember her being almost visible on the train in Minority Report. She made three more Shrek films and generally enjoyed this, like, comfortable mid-period part of her career. After Night and Day, things will slip a little bit. She'll make The Green Hornet and Bad Teacher the following year, the latter of which is a huge success, the former of which is better forgotten. Mm -hmm. Then in 2012, she makes What to Expect When You're Expecting, which is a very modest success. Sure. It's a small film anyway, but even by those terms, it's a very modest success. And she'll make Gambit, which is a disaster of such shocking magnitude that despite starring Cameron Diaz, Colin Firth, Alan Rickman, and Stanley Tucci, despite being written by the Coen brothers and directed by Michael Hoffman, who did, among other things, the 1999 Midsummer Night's Dream. Despite all of those things in its favor, the film is so bad that it is never released in <gasps> the United States. I was going to say I've never heard of it. It what gets is punted this? straight to streaming. It is a disaster. It, it's this time period, of course, but it's yeah. a disastrous remake of a very clever film from the 1960s. It's a heist movie and the marketing copy is we don't mind you telling people how it ends, just don't tell them how it begins. Because the first act of the movie is the heist going off with mechanical perfection. And then we cut out and we realize that what we have just seen is 
the planning stage for this heist. Oh. And then we run through the whole heist again with everything that going wrong familiar. and no one being as capable as they were presented to be in the first act. Is so, the original Michael Caine? It is. Okay. Yeah. See, I did know yeah. that. Weird. It's a, really Thanks, fun, it's a really fun film. I've never seen the remake because seeing the remake is really hard. <laughs> But that cast, Colin Firth, yeah, Alan Rickman, Stanley Tucci wow. in one movie? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should track it down. Maybe that could be our bonus episode. Does that sound like <laughs> uh, we're self-flagellating a little too a little much bit. here? <laughs> so this seems to be the turning point in Diaz's career. She makes The Counselor with Ridley Scott in 2013. 2014 finishes up with Sex Tape, which is pretty fine. Oh, I kind of yeah. like that movie. That was kind of cute. And Annie, which is weirdly kind of popular but nothing like as popular as everyone just assumed that it was going to be so it, even though it is successful it still comes off feeling like a failure mm. and at that point Cameron Diaz just retires she has made her you money she's very Respect. comfortable not yeah. making any more movies and she stays retired for a full decade she's returned this year to appear in the forthcoming back in action alongside Jamie Foxx Glenn Close and Kyle Chandler there's a name ooh, to conjure with ooh. that comes out this coming November and she's also back in the studio for the long-awaited, often rumored, much dreaded fifth official Shrek movie. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's the career of Cameron Diaz. Okay. I think she's kind of good in this film. I thought she was really cute. I think she's kind of charming. Her character really doesn't fundamentally make sense no. until she is dosed with the horny truth serum. <laughs> at which point everything comes into focus. And I think that if you kind of backport the idea that she's just she's been on a low grade dose of this horny truth serum for the whole movie, the entire thing makes more sense. Mm, Pretty cute though. Pretty yeah. cute. Yeah, I thought she was darling. Let's talk about Viola Davis, the brilliant oh, Viola fantastic. Davis, born in South Carolina in 1965, nothing less than a national treasure she mm -hmm. grows up in abject poverty the daughter of a noted civil rights activist and she discovers acting in high school and that changes the course of her entire life she attends rhode island college she attends juilliard as part of group 22 she's really the only person from group 22 who makes it she's really the only cool. person who wow. really breaks she graduates in 1993 and makes an immediate impact on broadway then moves to tv and film in 1996 in 1997 she appears in the aforementioned out of sight which mm -hmm. again strong recommendation very very good film in 2000 she's in traffic in 2001 she has that brilliant uncredited role as the parole board interrogator at the beginning of oceans 11 where she oh, is yeah. unbelievably fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Just scorches the screen. I think she's just, yeah, what a just fantastic. Yeah. And from there on, she's just, you know, going through the motions, securing her reputation as an absolute legend, probably most notably, or at least with the highest profile, in How to Get Away with Murder, which mm -hmm. runs six seasons from 2014 to 2020. I haven't seen a lot of that show because nothing in that show is half as good as Viola Davis yeah, is. Yeah, she's really, really and terrific, and everything kind of else is a little bit of a mess around her. Maybe true. Lisa Weil is half as good as Viola oh, Davis. Oh, sure. But that's yeah, about you really it. like her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. What's your I think I watched the whole first season of that and then just couldn't be compelled to keep going. Yeah. It's just, it's really messy. Yeah, yeah. It, it is ramshackle. Mm -hmm. yeah. A word that I have already used, I think, three times in the course well, of this Well, you know, I wonder this why. This podcast episode. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that Viola Davis is, yeah, generally fantastic. And I think she's very good in this film because this is exactly what you hire her to do, right? This is not yeah. at all distinct from the role that she will end up playing in the extended DC universe where she's cast as Amanda Waller, who is just kind of, well, it's exactly this part, except she works with superhumans. Sure. Over yeah. in the DC verse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that tracks. Peter Sarsgaard, similarly excellent casting here, born in Illinois in 1971. His father's an Air Force engineer and he moves 12 times as a kid. I can relate. He attended a private Jesuit prep school in Connecticut. I can't so much relate to that, obviously. <laughs> and then he attends Bard for two years before transferring to Washington University in St. Louis, where he earns a bachelor's degree in history. His first movie role is Dead Man Walking with uh, wow. Sean Penn and Sarandon in 1995. Oh, he establishes himself as a really safe pair of hands in any ensemble through the 1990s sure. and then kind of steps up to leading man position in 2003's biopic Shattered Glass. He's in Garden State with Zach Braff. I don't know if oh, you remember yeah. him I don't in remember that. him in that. He appears alongside Liam Neeson in Kinsey. The year after Night and Day, he plays Sinestro, the villain in the Green Lantern movie, which is not so great. And then just, yeah, continues to work and continues to be Peter Sarsgaard. He is sure. married to Maggie Gyllenhaal. And we That's have seen right. their very pleasant Brooklyn townhouse on the Architectural Digest yes, YouTube have. channel. Because right. try as you might, you can't podcast 24 hours a day. Sometimes <laughs> you have to stop 
and go watch, what is it, Open Door with AD? Open Door with AD is, I think, yeah. it indeed. Yeah. Here's our recommendation of the week. Go watch the Architectural <laughs> Digest <laughs> YouTube channel. Do you, Do you have a favorite that you can recommend? Vanessa Hudgens. Vanessa. <laughs> Absolutely. hundred percent. Vanessa Hudgens. Yes. That is the greatest house and she's nothing but charming oh my god yes (laughs) she's a couple other things besides charming i would say but yes 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 yes, you do have a a well-testified crush crush on vanessa (laughs) as you should quite frankly speaking of women (laughs) on whom you have a crush let's talk about gal gadot born in 1985 in israel she graduated high school with an interest in biology she enters the miss israel pageant when she is 18 and wins cool she then goes on to compete that same year in the miss universe pageant in ecuador where she doesn't win, but still acquits herself very nicely. Beauty pageants are so weird. It's so, so weird, weird that they still exist. Oh, I know man. we're talking about 2004, a full, you know, two decades ago. It's still it's so still weird that happening. they even exist. Yeah, it's it is so weird. strange. Yep, yeah, I agree. After her compulsory service in the Israel Defense Forces, she begins parallel careers as a model and an actress. Night and Day comes very early in her acting career. It's her third credit after playing Giselle in Fast and Furious, the fourth oh, the fast and cool. the furious movie she goes on to appear in five fast and furious movies in I total i didn't know that but and that's a good spot for her it's I a great feel spot like. for her yeah absolutely wow. and she appears in a small role in the steve carell tina fey comedy date night i don't know if you've ever seen date Ooh. night it's not that good but it does have its I high points maybe yeah. but i don't remember it very well as i say godot will go on to appear in five fast and furious movies but she really breaks in 2016 of course when Naturally. she is the most obvious bit of casting in the world for wonder woman where She's she fantastic. just fits yeah. that that role like a glove she stuns from the first moment that yep. she appears on screen in batman versus superman dawn of justice a very terrible film that is actually somewhat redeemed by gal Gadot showing up <laughs> by that musical sting behind her ah, just it's it's never saw that one. maybe one of the best debuts that that there's ever been you wow. know, I, I just think it's a tremendous piece of work she also gained of course some real criticism for her Let's say oh, yeah. ill-conceived and wildly condescending release of a, a star-studded cover version of John Lennon's Imagine in the early days of the pandemic quarantine. That Was that like her idea? I thought she was just yes. one of the people. No, it oh. was she. She absolutely led the charge. She recruited everybody for that thing. She put the thing together. Oh, and it's like, very I get well it. Intentioned, well intentioned. Very well intentioned. Extremely tone deaf. To- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. I will link to that in the show notes. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, we're probably far enough away from it that you can watch it now maybe. and maybe even enjoy it now. Maybe. Maybe. But yes, yeah. absolutely the wrong thing at absolutely the wrong time yeah finally let's round this out with a brief discussion of paul dana who i think yeah is is really quite good in this film he's born in 1984 in new york city he grows up in the city and in connecticut he attends eugene lang college he appears on stage at the royal theater in 1996 starts making films in 2000 but doesn't really break until his star turn a well-deserved star turn i think in little miss sunshine in 2006 he's in there will be blood in 2007 after night and day he'll be in Looper in 2012 and Swiss Army Man with Daniel Radcliffe in 2016. He will play two of cinema's greatest villains in 2022. He will play the Riddler in The Batman and he'll play Steven Spielberg's dad in The Fablemans. Two of cinema's (laughs) greatest monsters. Wow. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Wow, that's serious, man. The Fablemans is a wild one. Yeah, yeah. I like his performance in it. Although he does seem to... I don't think that movie's good. That's what it comes down to. I think there are I things really about that movie. I really wanted to love it. I really wanted to be just moved. Good. Yeah. But I think. But it turns out that maybe your personal therapeutic exercise is not going to result yeah. in great art, even if maybe. you're Steven Spielberg. Yep. You know who I loved? Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen. <laughs> <laughs> also, David Lynch. So, oh my God, the David Lynch turn yeah. as John Ford at the end of that movie is one of the best things that I've ever seen <laughs> on a screen. It is so good. Yep. Well worth the price of admission for, yeah, what, 30 seconds right at the end of that film? <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Ah, so, so good. So good. <laughs> this movie shoots in three months between September and December of 2009. They shoot extensively in Massachusetts. They shoot a little in Illinois and in California. And they shoot a lot in both Austria and in Andalusia. The score for the movie is written by John Powell, who breaks into the industry in 1997 with the score for the Cage Travolta movie Face Off. Obviously, you can sure. really hear the influence there. So he, is that score that like the, the I don't know what you want to call it. It's like Parisian techno jazz. Yes. That, I love what that Isn't sound it really is. Interesting? I don't know what it's yes. called, but anytime I hear that particular like 
Paris lo-fi something something. Yeah, I that's like That's exactly it, what it right? is, right? It's completely anticipating, yes, a French cafe for studying yeah. lo-fi on YouTube. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I dig it. It's really good. It's really good. That's the really interesting thing about John Powell is that he doesn't have a, a, a terribly extensive career, but every single score that he's written is wildly different. As I say, face off, he scores Shrek, which has to be one of oh. the most thankless jobs in it. Can you think of a single scored Not theme the scored from, no, because yeah, the soundtrack the music. does all yeah. the heavy lifting in that movie he scores the born identity which actually has a really great sound to it. it it's more like a soundscape than it is like cool. a traditional film score but it's it's excellent he scores the terrible mark Wahlberg remake of the italian job in mm -hmm. 2003 which again at least sounds really interesting and of course he scores mr and mrs smith which sounds oh. great okay that movie has a really great score to it sure. so he's done a lot of, of of really good work and a lot of very distinct work i think the score for this film rocks i think it's I really totally good. agree with yeah. the exception of the ending credit song Yes, that that's last it. song was so bad. I think the Someday, needle drops is that what it was called? stink. Yeah. <laughs> Every time a song is played, it's very bad. And maybe that oh, just. Oh, it's like Louie Louie. It wasn't Louie 18 Louie? times? So many. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. But And maybe that, maybe it's just the sharp contrast with that song being played 18 times <laughs> that makes the score seem so great. But maybe. the score is really great. The other thing that Powell did is a Solo, a Star Wars story, where he is oh, taking all yeah. of that John Williams inspiration sure. and putting it to use. The score for that film isn't always successful, but it is always interesting. What he is trying to do with these titanic themes, like every single person on Earth knows what a Star Wars movie sounds like. Yeah. And he really tries to do some interesting stuff within that space that is both respectful and consistent, but also bringing some new dimensionality to it. I, really I think cool. that he does really interesting work yeah. on that. So Night and Day is released on June 23rd, 2010, is ironically one of two new releases that week because the other is Grown Ups starring Adam Sandler, directed by Dennis Dugan. Number one at the box office is the second week of Toy Story 3, which sure. has already made $227 million <laughs> in a little less than 14 days. Grown Ups goes in at number two and makes almost double what Night and Day makes at number three at the box office. I don't remember Grown Ups at all. It's one of those Adam Sandler wants to make a movie with his buddies and oh, yeah. they'll no, just I don't go like on those. vacation yeah. and make a film. It's Adam Sandler <laughs> and it's Kevin James and it's David Spade who is really unpleasant oh, in those films. Sure. It's Chris Rock Sama Hayek, I think, is oh, in that one. So. Okay. But really, yes, I, I just read you that cast list and now you know exactly what yeah, that film is. Heard. You can anticipate gotcha. every possible move that it will make. The remake of The Karate Kid is number four at the box oh, office. Yeah. The remake of The A-Team is number five, a movie that nobody remembers. And apart from Iron Man 2 and Sex and the City 2, duking it out neck and neck further down Whoa, the list. Uh -huh. The most notable thing in the entire box office list is the second week of the Josh Brolin, Megan Fox, DC Western Jonah Hex. Do you remember Jonah no, Hex? No, not at all. I'm not at all surprised because it is in its second week and its audience has fallen by 70%. Ooh. That is some toxic word of Yikes. mouth surrounding that <laughs> film, which was, of course, ultimately a failure. Mm. Night and Day makes a disappointing $76 million at the domestic box office on a budget of $117 million. Oh, yeah. But the international gross is strong enough that it finally makes $262 million worldwide. It more than doubles its budget. It seems like a rental for sure. But there is this strong sense that so much money was left on the table. There is yeah. this strong sense that, yes, it cleared its budget, but it should have made twice as much. Yeah. And as I yeah. say, the marketing team is absolutely to blame for that. And the marketing team, in their defense, very publicly stepped up after the film's failure and said, yeah, that one's on us. Wow. We really did a bad job with this. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was going to watch the trailer, but it always feels like a little bit of a cursed object to go and watch the trailer before you do the trailer game. Absolutely. So now I'm going to have yeah. to go back and see You it, just have to go and look at the posters. The posters do not at all communicate what this film is. The posters, I know that the like whatever the image they give for renting the movie or whatever doesn't communicate it at all. Is it, it the weird white more... silhouettes on the orange swirl background? Is that no? What this seeing? is the two of them, the on, two the of them on the motorcycle, and they each okay. have the guns pointing so the opposite direction, so it looks that, very like Bondy. That is a post hoc edition. As bad as that is, that was added in after the film's release for its its DVD wow. releases. Yeah. The original looks like some kind of, yeah, 60s throwback, like it's yeah. it's leaning into like an Austin Powers kind of direction in a way that you don't want for this. Yeah, it's it's a real, just, just calamitous miss. misfire. Absolutely. Wow, they that's were, so They were running two parallel trailer streams, one set of trailers making it look like an out-and-out -out comedy, and one set of trailers making it look like an out-and-out -out action film. And of course, 
this film is going to satisfy neither of those audiences. Neither. That's what's so interesting. And people yeah. are seeing both versions of the trailer, so God. they're just left without a sense of what the film yeah. is ultimately about. What, well, what me too, and I just is. watched the whole thing. <laughs> and that's the thing, is that that's actually the most reflective thing that the marketing <laughs> campaign could have done. They very accurately <laughs> represent the wild swings that this movie takes. Yeah. And it we, just You're so right. It never does land on the tone. Like, it just never no, figures out what the tone of the movie absolutely is. Absolutely not. Yeah. I think the opening is pretty strong. I and you do. I don't think that it was. Go ahead. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let's get into it, and we'll, we'll talk about it as sure, we sure. go. Why not? We open, of course, in Wichita, the fabled. <laughs> it's so weird that you keep on talking about Wichita, and the project used to be named Wichita, but they just fly out of it, yeah. and it's never seen again, right? That, that is exactly weird. the extent of okay. <laughs> the presence of Wichita in this one. <laughs> But this is why Patrick O'Neill gets the sole writing credit is because there's enough of that original DNA left in the script that the WGA can shrug their shoulders and say, well, it's obviously all him. Yeah. Which is demonstrably insane. You couldn't possibly look at this film and think that it was written by one man. No. (laughs) And if it were, that man ought to be hospitalized. (laughs) Yeah. In the fabled, legendary Wichita, home of the glamorous and and perfect, Roy Miller is enjoying mm. the many varied amenities that you'll find in the Wichita International Airport. A really shitty looking the ice cream The continental yeah. Airport, I guess, is how they're referring to it. That's how the voiceover sure. refers to it, which is interesting. June Havens, meanwhile, is trying to make her flight. The two literally collide on both sides of the gate. Mm-hmm. It's probably just a coincidence, right? <laughs> and then June is bumped from the flight. I that kind part of doesn't like make any sense. This opening. Yeah. Why doesn't it make sense? Okay. Why is she bumped from the flight and then put back on the flight? Because, Explain. Because the flight is a setup to kill Roy Miller. Okay. Everybody so on the flight not... is in on it. It's not a real flight. That's why she is bumped in the first place. Then oh. Viola Davis sees her, thinks that she is someone important, thinks that she is somehow involved, and so pulls the strings to put her on the flight. She is deliberately so that she will also be killed in this what? killed or captured or whatever is supposed to happen. Taken yeah, I mean, I don't know what the what whatever. the gambit here yeah. is with yeah. Roy Miller. Okay. Like, yes, how does this end? It's a really Wild. great question right. that we can ask at almost every turn of this script. <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> is a very consistent question yeah. through this. Film. Okay, interesting. But I like the energy that we're playing with here, and I kind of like. Cruz's wild intensity in this film is so interesting because it feels so much like the real Tom Cruise, right? He's just too goddamn intense <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and he's extremely good at everything that he tries to do, sure. which is off-putting, frankly, yeah. coupled with that intensity, right? We're not really seeing a competence that we can lean into or, or even appreciate. It just feels inhuman. Yeah. And I it, kind it of It is a little like bit inhuman, that. yeah. I don't love how completely ineffectual June is right from the jump. Like, cannot do anything on her own, is really just stumbling through this movie. Yeah, and then having that character beat that she restores old cars, which ends up not being anything and not meaning anything, like, besides that they get to drive the genuinely ugly GTO at the end of the film. It does mean something. But what it means is maybe not what was intended. Okay. Because she restores cars, she's working on her dad's old GTO. This is very important to her. Her dad is gone now. She's really like trying to, in some sense, live up to his influence, right? That's what repairing the GTO is really all about. That's why she's flying halfway across the country to get parts for this car so that she can fly back and finally restore it for her her sister's wedding. She's really missing her dad right there, there's it's some to be real a daddy issues thing well gee i don't know but later when tom cruise tells her that she's got skills he calls her by her name and says that she's got skills and she glows like she finally got the affirmation that she always oh, wanted from her dad there nice is definitely read. a dimension to this film that is daddy issues the movie yeah which even takes care of the age gap. It makes sense DS. with Riley too. What's his real name? Right? Sorry, now I'm just calling him Riley. No, that's all right. Uh... We, can, we can just call him Mark Lucas. <laughs> what is his name? It's another R name. I no, feel like. Raymond. 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 Because of course, and Roy and... of course, you're yeah. going to have okay. Raymond and Roy. Sure, yes. naturally. Anyway, yeah, that explains Raymond a little bit more. I think this might be just nice a series of type. jokes that editors played on each other as this was bouncing around <laughs> the studio. <laughs> Again, perfect casting for Mark Lucas. But we will get to him because first we're going to do this sequence on the plane. 
which is really kind of cute. And I, I think, think it's kind of cute. It drags a little bit, but it's it kind of cute. It does a little bit. They do have chemistry. It does I take agree. forever for her to get up and go to the bathroom. We, we yeah, don't and then need all the stuff with her talking to herself in the mirror. Is all like, that oh exposition. Right yeah. yeah, half the amount of her talking to herself in the mirror, mm-hmm. I think, would be cute, particularly because it's a character beat that we do not return to in right. the rest of the film. Right. This is not a part of who she June is just at talk to herself all. a lot. Yeah. And I genuinely love her psyching herself up coming out of the bathroom and going and kissing that fool. I think so too. That's yep, great. It's good. Frankly, more people should do that. <laughs> I think it's really strong. And I really like too the way that we are playing the comedic beats of, you know, the door to the cockpit just flapping back yes. and forth. <laughs> pretty good yeah that's funny there's, there's true. a fair amount to like here and i even enjoy the way that we handle weapons here at the beginning because i now understand that these are silenced weapons that are being yes. used here on the plane which is a justification for june and no one else right like yeah. we don't need them to be silenced there's no reason for them to be silenced except that we are preserving june's innocence comedically at mm-hmm. this point but i thought for a moment that they were like tranquilizer darts yes i thought so that, did that I. was how we were you know yeah, making this at whole least thing somebody unfold. got hit with some at kind least of a some dart, of them are, right? but not yeah. all of them are. And I like the idea that we were leaning into a more, yeah, it's just a more gentle, less had they all been masculine kind of yes, sort of tranquilizer darts yeah. and or I don't know what I didn't like all of the you know like automatic weapons and yeah. stuff. It's There's just too much. Just too much. And, and yeah, we're sometimes playing guns as though they are extremely deadly. Yeah, as they are, and we're sometimes playing them as though they are comedic props. Right. The sequence much later in the warehouse Mm -hmm. where Cameron Diaz panics and just fires that gun, that is not okay. Like that is not a funny joke on its own terms and certainly doesn't fit with the rest of the film as we understand it. So yes, we have June and Roy talking. We get this grip of backstory about June's family that's not really going to be important for the rest of it. We have the break in the bathroom. We have the kiss. And then he tells her that the pilots are dead and that the plane is crashing, which thanks to him, I guess it does. Yeah, yeah. So he kind of sort of lands it a little. Uh, kind of, kind yeah. of, yeah. In some of the worst CGI I've ever seen. That's Maybe the other this thing. is the reason why he's then going to be like, you know what? Practical effects, y'all. Right. <laughs> I'm just going to crash the actual plane. Just yes. film me. <laughs> That's exactly right. I think this is, yeah. This film looks bad in a way that only really expensive films from 2010 right. can look bad. And which I is, hate it. Yeah. You clearly threw a ton of money at yeah. it at every single effect shot, and they all look like garbage, yep. which is unfortunate, really. Like, I don't take any joy or pleasure in that because so much of the cinematography of this film actually looks great because when you go to Austria and you go to Spain and mm-hmm. you're shooting in like the oldest parts of Boston and yeah. Massachusetts, like a lot of this film looks really, really good when it is practical and when it is digital holy smokes it looks terrible and this isn't even i think flipping cars too there was like oh god that that car chase scene gun chase scene whatever is among the worst things i've ever watched absolutely right so after the crash we get the sequence where roy drugs her and then debriefs Mm. her and then she passes out he kind of (laughs) drugs and debriefs well, that's going to come back, I guess. A of times. Yeah. Because <laughs> why would you write filler oh material? Why God. would you why would you write the scene where we move from one set piece to another when, when you, can you can just, just... have your character be continually roofied <laughs> by a stranger? <laughs> why write any of that connective tissue? That stuff's hard. Yeah, I've had to do it. It's yeah. really difficult to sometimes just, get your plot from one space eyes to another blink space. open and they just, blink shut. That's exactly eyes it. Eyes blink open and blink shut. And now we're in another setting. I mean, she is going to have neurological trauma as a result of this film. Wow. She wakes up at home alongside this array of post-it notes, which is kind of cute, I guess. Kind of cute, yeah. And then Mark Lucas is at the door, just a big slab of a man (laughs) with a little slab of a mustache. June decides naturally to pretend that none of this ever happened and goes about her This is where she starts the whole beat about being a terrible listener because he tells her very clearly what to say and not to say and she does the opposite immediately. Because she's really fundamentally incapable. Like she's really... Yeah, it's a shame. Just ambling through this plot and Mm. without any... Yeah, without any capability, without any agency, she's really even making a choice. She's just reactive. She just screams a lot, particularly through the first half of the film. And then we suddenly rewrite her to make her capable which 
I works can't much better. Applaud as a narratological maneuver, but I can at least appreciate as an audience member who gets to watch Cameron Diaz be kind of cool at the end of this right. film. Right. Yeah. It's pretty good. She has the dress fitting with her sister Shannon from Lost. Yes. Who is mm-hmm. as terrible in this film as she was in Lost. Yeah, I do see again the casting. Like the casting. They, they can be sisters. I see it. <laughs> yeah. I do. Also, I don't like you or care about you at all. Yeah. <laughs> which just really keeps my focus on June as we move forward. That's true. That's true. At no point in this film are we expected to give a damn about April's wedding. It's true. I do like that her name is April. It's April it's and June. Cute. It's yeah, cute. It's cute. Yeah. She's then picked up by Peter Sarsgaard, who is definitely a good guy, no question. There's <laughs> a fire. She's getting the car. She gets in the car immediately, of even though she does. Roy told her yep. under no circumstances, get into a vehicle with these people. We do the implausible motorcycle stunt. Of oh my god, the motorcycle. The motorcycle going up the ramp and yes. then appearing at the top of the ramp, flying through the air without a rider anymore. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly Roy's on top of the car. There's a chase, an extended chase. There's some action. There's like a, a lot of compositing through this sequence yeah. and it all this looks very bad. This is a real bad. bad one. And then Roy's in the driver's seat rescuing her. This, I think, is the worst looking sequence in the film. I think so too. I really no, think this one that was this really is, tough. Yeah, is, is real bad. And I wonder how much of this was simply put together in the editing room after mm. principal photography was over because, yeah, it, it really sets a low bar that the film, the rest of the film kind yeah. of exceeds and only looks good by comparison, honestly. Mm. But yeah, not so I great. will say that as far as like driving nightmares go, being in the back seat trying to get to the front to hit the brakes is definitely like that's yeah. that's my nightmare dream yeah. that I have for sure. I am in the back of the car. The car is out of control. I'm having trouble getting to the front <laughs> of the car. That's how it goes. A real Cameron Diaz dream for sure. <laughs> I wish. Roy compliments June's dress. He compliments her timing. She glows a little bit. And then he goes in to kill the guys in the tunnel while June runs and catches a bus and Roy oh, follows yeah. her even catches when she goes in again. to visit with Mark Blucas and yeah you know things are bad when you're turning to Mark Blucas for help you're turning to this <laughs> potato of a man for help your life is probably not going great but this is I think really good I, I genuinely you know I'm <laughs> yes, somewhat biased against Mark Blucas because of Riley Finn who is sure. a genuinely terrible character and just yeah even by the standards of Buffy's boyfriends like the worst <laughs> not quite the worst Scott Hope Buffy fans at home Scott oh. Hope is the actual worst boyfriend that she ever has, but never mind, we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> but I think that he's terrific because, yeah, he's exactly who you would cast in this role. And he works beautifully. And the way that he kind of rises to the occasion when Roy comes in and starts asking him about being a firefighter and like empathizing with him and very much being very Tom cute. Cruise in real life. If you've ever seen Tom Cruise like <laughs> on a red carpet, yes. that is exactly the energy that he brings. This laser focused and too intense attention. That is just Tom Cruise. Wow. And it's kind of good. I kind of like the sequence in the restaurant. How do you feel about it? I think it's good. And I think that Rodney is quite funny with just the way he's giving just doe eyes at June (laughs) while she's talking, but super not listening to her at all. And she comes out and is like, no, are we even listening to me? And then here he comes. I'm the guy. All of it was pretty cute. This is the guy. This is the guy. That's (laughs) That, it's good. It's good. I, I think, think Diaz is yeah, delivering. Mm-hmm. And certainly delivers when Roy claps handcuffs on her and takes her out. Yeah. Shoots Rodney in the leg. Apologizes for doing so. But, you know, it's, it's a through and through. I didn't go near the bone. I didn't go near any major yeah. arteries. You're going to be fine. <laughs> He'll and be a hero. When we bounce back to that in just a little bit, when she's at the gas station and she sees him on the news being interviewed and yep. he is playing the role of the dopey hero. It's really, again. That's smart. Somebody's doing some writing. Someone's, someone's, someone's doing some Someone is finding work. some moments. Even yep. the backstory of this script. Someone's doing something. And I love, too, the sequence that we get on the top of the parking garage where he's explaining to her what it is that he's done. I am making you safe by proving to everyone that you are not a part of this. I just kidnapped you in public. Oh, yeah. And that That's means true. that you're going to be okay. We just have to get through this next bit and yeah. then you are going to be okay. I think is really interesting. It is. This is the first time when we're on the roof of the parking garage, this is the first time that he starts getting a little oddly petulant. There's something like, I don't know, there's something I know what you're talking boyish about, about his yeah. hurt feelings sure. at this point. Like, like she's not completely trusting him and he's kind of sour about it. And it's <laughs> difficult to pin down. It will echo through the rest of the film, I mm-hmm. think. But it's, a, it's an odd moment. We then get the introduction of the Zephyr, this miracle perpetual motion battery, which spoilers will turn out not to work, but which will very conveniently wrap up this film without our protagonists having to actually do anything (laughs) in order to accomplish their goals. Uh So uh, foreshadowing. Is the Zephyr a MacGuffin? Yes. 
I think so too. Okay, yes. good. It All right. does not matter. Right. What it is. It is functionally it's, interchangeable with a briefcase full of money. Exactly, Therefore, it exactly. is technically That's what I thought. Thing. Just yes. wanted to make sure. I guess you could stretch the point in that it does explode at the very end and thus sure. kills Peter Sarsgaard. <laughs> <laughs> and really does just end the plot very neatly. Very neatly. That's so true. So in that way, it, it does have a little bit of functional utility, but mm-hmm. mostly for, for certainly the vast majority of the film, it really is, yeah, I think a technical MacGuffin. Mm-hmm. I will call out too, since I really do want to call out some of the great writing in this film, I will call out the little exchange that ends this sequence as she reclines the chair, obviously intending to go to sleep, and asks him, were you really a Boy Scout? And he says, an Eagle Scout. And she says, I was a Brownie. And he says, oh, cool. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> cool was a really it's just it was really cute. good yeah and, and really nice naturalistic delivery from that was nice I too i don't know if they made it a surprise or if i missed the beat where they got onto the convertible on top of the semi mm-hmm. but when i'm like he look at the road look look at the road look at the road <laughs> and then you oh i see oh, that was we don't cute. have to look yeah. at the road yeah it's nice it's cute it's good in Brooklyn, they go to where Simon was being hidden. Roy solves the clues while June plays with his gun and unseen figures move into position. Roy takes charge. There's another fight sequence. This is where we get the joke about her panicking and running into gunfire, which is weird. And yeah. she's just Stop squeaky. Stop saying my name. You're freaking me out. and helpless, right? Yeah. Yeah, weird. that's a good line, actually. I went it and was. Looked. I found a transcript online, and he says her name. 84 times, conservatively, <gasps> 84 times in the course of the film. Wow. Yeah, which is, in fairness, a lot. That is a lot, yeah. <laughs> but it's also like that weird, yes, that weird, too intense and too focused on you Tom Cruise energy, right? It's like mm. uh, how to win friends and influence people. It's that say their name, have physical contact with someone and say their name and they will immediately be swayed by the power of your personality. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just Tom Cruise, though. <laughs> Yeah, and when I when I think about James Mangold talking about wanting the film to be more improvisational, there's no accounting online anywhere because none of the earlier drafts actually exist. The only draft that actually exists is the original one, which I did read a little bit of, and which is completely different wow. from the film as it's presented. Sure. WGA be damned. There's no like shooting script available online, so it's impossible to see how much of this dialogue was improvised on the day. But there are these moments when you think. Yeah, this could just be the two of them having a conversation in a really mm. nice way. And then, obviously, some of it feels so architected. It feels right. so authored that, you know, it's good in a different kind of way, I guess. So we very effectively damsel June through this whole sequence. But then we come out into this interesting impressionistic montage of her passing out and coming to in yes. the plane and coming to in the car. and Just having this, like, sense experience of what being in a Tom Cruise movie would be like. <laughs> Uh-huh. I kind of like that as a device. I really hate when we come back to it at the end of the film. Yeah. I think that sucks. <laughs> and the fact that in the last five minutes of the movie, we have to repeat every single thing that we established yeah. earlier. That is like the chintziest, shallowest version of you know Robert McKee's story strategy coming into play here. We don't need to do all of that. But here I think it's actually very effective. And then she wakes up. Looking like a million bucks in a bikini and a hammock. Right. A hot damn. Yes. It's yes. Wonderful. I it <laughs> is, but I did have a note that was like, "Oh right? my god, how did she get into this yes. bikini?" And then I was really grateful when she said, "Oh my god, how did I get into this bikini?" I don't find. I, I I don't know how I feel about that joke. I mean, she does try to punch him in the face. That's 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 what it worked. She tries to punch him in the face. Yeah. He dodges it and says, wait, wait, wait. No, I deserve that. Go ahead. Hit me again. That's me. such like, a great beat. You know? Sorry, that was instinct. Yeah. Try, hit me again. I'll let you hit me this time. <laughs> that is actually really good. I think so, too. It's terrible that he undressed her and put her it's, in the bikini. Th- that's really and terrible. The, the bikini really, is really terrible. so revealing. It, it, like, it's such a, even by the standards of a bikini, you guys, yeah. it's a small bikini. Right? And, and also, where did he get it? Yeah. Also, <laughs> well, he went shopping with her, obviously. <laughs> You didn't see that moment when she had the, the eyelids Part flutter the open montage. and crushing the montage as they go into Victoria's Secret, right? Ew. Yeah, right? That's the thing. Every time you poke it, it makes it's it worse. worse. Every time you try to oh, figure out this no. film, it just it sinks into its own morass uh, right as you watch it. Yeah. But it is, yeah, cute. And yes, you're right. Her pushing back against him does at least give the scene some, some dynamism and yes. some energy. She leaves. She takes his phone with her for some reason so that we can foreshadow the rest of the movement of the plot i guess she gets the call claiming to be from april but she's on the island which we demonstrate this is an example of the tone of the film being 
so really inconsistent and misaligned. Yeah, but wait, wait, wait. Does she take his phone? I thought that 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 was her phone and actually April calling her, but they were tracking both phones. She has both phones because she has the glimpse of the address of his parents' house. Oh, yeah. That's where she gets that information, which she then memorizes, as you would, Uh. so that she can track down his parents later in the movie. And that's right. On the plane, he got like the motion alert from his parents' house. But why? His dad was just in the garage. Is he watching them to protect them? I possibly? don't know. Right? You would think that there's a version of this character who is keeping an eye on his parents, not for sentimental reasons, but because he knows that any cover story is imperfect and he wouldn't want anyone getting to his parents as a means of applying leverage to him. Right? It's sure. the kind of thing that Peter Sarsgaard would definitely do. I feel like he makes them conspicuous by making them, well, I guess, does, does he just, does he fake the winning of the sweepstakes and like it's all so, it's so much I it's don't so know. much yeah it's not explained <laughs> the two possible interpretations of that right are that yes he is actually directly manipulating the publishers clearing house right. and whatever all these other competitions sure. that they keep winning right that he is doing that himself which you're right would surely attract a lot of attention <laughs> by the IRS if no one else <laughs> Right. Elliot Ness and the rest of the Treasury <laughs> agents are going to be down on them like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Or there's an explanation that it's Viola Davis who is doing this. And it's actually like his military pension that is that is being oh, paid in right, as part of his cover story wow. for dying in the Gulf. That this is the, the yeah. quasi CIA or whoever it is that Viola Davis is working for. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. It's, it's a possibility okay, possible. at least. Sure. But the problem with this sequence is, yeah, the comedic zoom out that we get to show us from our privileged position high above the island, sure. that this is in fact an island. A tiny island. Mm-hmm. But we play this like it is a beat that June is realizing, except from where she is, she cannot see this shot that demonstrates that it's an island. Well, I think it's just that she went running through the jungle and then immediately came out on the other side and it's an ocean. I think that that's like, she might think she's on a skinny part of a peninsula, but... She could be on an isthmus. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> this... <laughs> she could. I knew sixth grade geography would pay off someday. <laughs> And maybe someday it will. (laughs) She runs back to him and they play fight on the beach. And again, suddenly out of nowhere, there's some sexual chemistry happening here. It's kind of hot. It is kind of hot. Yeah. Yeah, But also a little, yeah, you're worried for her. Just a little worried for her. He teaches her how to break out of a very specific hold in a way that will pay off in seven and one half minutes. Yep. That is the gap between her learning this trick and actually (sighs) putting it to use. And that sucks. Yeah. Don't yep. do that. It is only <laughs> effective when you foreshadow something like that. You have to give the audience enough space. time to forget, to forget about for it. for a second. The yeah. moment that they forget about it is the moment that you should bring it back. And yep. no one is forgetting anything that is foreshadowed that hard in seven and a half minutes. Yeah. I promise. Particularly when the grip is is so specific. Right? Very, it's not yeah. even just when someone's coming at you. It's this. No, if I am holding you in exactly this way, here's how you get out of it. And then they're attacked by a CGI drum. Which is yeah. an odd choice Tough. for, yeah, a 2010 film that can't really pull off Mm-mm. a CGI drone. There's a lot of screaming and chasing and explosions. Again, explosions in the jungle. Lots of explosions. Sure. How are you feeling about the film at this point? Uh, it is bonkers, but I am having <laughs> fun. Like, I am having fun. I'm, I'm mad about the bikini, but then she wants to hit him and he wants to let her hit him. And I don't know. Like, I'm it's, uh, it's dancing with trouble all of the time. Yeah. But it seems to be skirting the thing that will just make me turn the movie off and hate it, you know? That's a really astute observation, right? There's something about its fragmented structure. There's something about, like, the impermanence of each moment as you're watching the film (laughs) Uh that does kind of make it difficult to turn off. You you don't ever really build up enough (laughs) momentum (laughs) to motivate you to reach for the remote. You're just, oh, and now this is, oh, and now this is, oh, and now this is, okay, all right, okay, sure. For yeah. example, Roy might give her the Vulcan neck pinch and knock her out, and then suddenly she's on a train in Austria. Very sexy train. An extremely sexy train. That, wow. Are Who's, there are there really trains like that? Yes. Wow. Who's looks so hot in this sequence? Yeah. His little mock turtleneck blazer combo yeah, 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 that yeah, he's yeah. rocking? So hot. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I do. And I we're going to really waste our time so. here yeah. having a fight in a we kitchen also, car. That's the other thing I didn't talk about on the beach. Great physique on Tom Cruise in this movie. I mean, he's, wow. he's renowned for it. Wow. And it's nice that they are both, because there's a version of this that's, that's Glenn Powell and Sidney Sweeney Absolutely. doing exactly this story. right? <laughs> yes. And it wouldn't work because 
these two people really are adults. They are yeah. adult enough that they have baggage and, yeah, and emotional absolutely. weight to them. And that plays both as, as a balance to them and also as a motivation to them in a way that I think is mm. really, yeah, is really interesting. I do think that there's something good and, and well motivated at the yeah. heart of this story. I think that there there is something that's well intentioned at the heart of that. That's right. And you had said they marketed it as grown yeah. up or something, Which right? It is, yeah. Right? And, and so it is. And yeah. I think that's yeah, that that's that's a good point. Very fair. Yeah. Well I say that June Havens is a grown up, but when she's ordering breakfast on the train, she orders pancakes, scrambled eggs, and a large glass of milk <laughs> like she is six years old. <laughs> That's a bad breakfast, you guys. That was you want something a with a bit of sequence. Yeah, but you're on a glamorous train in Austria. Yeah, like maybe something that's a little you know just, would just have been a little cute. more elevated. She should have ordered the omelet that he made her and left in her house. Excellent. She should have been craving it every day since. Excellent. Thanks. That's good. See, you're a natural screenwriter. <laughs> you could be the thirteenth screenwriter on this film. <laughs> Lucky thirteen. <laughs> So this is where we introduce Bernhard, the assassin, who's here to just, yeah, prompt a fight scene in sure. the kitchen car. It's fine. It's a pretty decent sequence. It's well choreographed, at least. I mean, we have to kind of buy Roy going out like a punk in the first instance, like for the first time, for the only time in the film, in fact, he gets properly beaten up. Yeah. And it's just to give June the space to be effective. But of course, she's only effective in the way that he just taught her to be effective. Yeah. So really, he's the so awesome really, one. So really, yeah. You know, we're yeah. not actually giving her too much power. We will, ultimately, again, we're going to rewrite yeah. her character about two-thirds of the way through, and suddenly <laughs> she's going to be awesome. But right now, she's actually just learning just these sweet, sweet lessons. sweet dum-dum. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And mm. a shout-out to the very kind Austrian chef. Who, when she breaks into the, oh, the kitchen car yes. in the first place, she's like, yes, of course, sit down. Can I get you some water? It's just like really lovely yeah, to her. Yeah, actually, darling. Yeah. And, th and then killed outright by yeah. the nefarious Bernhardt. Shame. But he gets what's his. He gets what's coming to him, which is to say he gets blown through a window, <laughs> clinging onto sausages, and then scraped off by a passing train <laughs> in the other direction. Yeah. This film, you guys. That's right. <laughs> And yeah, because that's Simon. Simon is Paul Dano, right? Yes, yes. He's saying, why won't he just die? <laughs> and then the train. I guess it's great funny. casting. It's yes, good. yeah. <laughs> then all at once, we're in Salzburg, which looks tremendous. Yes, it looks does. Looks so, yes, it so does. beautiful. Mm. June takes a bath because, of course, you would if you're in that I hotel room. I certainly would. Yeah. yeah. And then she meets with Roy on the balcony. She promises not to leave the room, but then. For reasons which aren't entirely clear, except the movement of the plot, she decides to leave the room and because trail Roy. really, he did want her to follow, and I don't know. I don't she know. says that later, and I don't follow her logic <laughs> either time. Yeah. Really? I don't know. Really? <laughs> she manages to spy on his meeting with the incredibly beautiful Naomi, the Gal Gadot uh -huh. character, who really doesn't get anything to do, but is, as I said earlier, just a functional special effect at the heart of the yes. film. Like, just so amazing looking. Mm -hmm. And then she hears Roy say that she's no one special. And then she's picked up by Viola yeah. Davis. I'm bridging here probably the worst moment in the entire I, I was going to say you can't skip that part. The moment yeah. that we can't really, I think forgive it is, it is a real don't know how they let it go. yes on this movie we're talking about the moment when in order to intimidate antonio the spanish arms dealer who is behind this entire side of the plot uh -huh. in and order like to intimidate earpiece. him when he is not present and right. is communicating with naomi through her very large 2010 earpiece roy very unpleasantly grips gal Gadot's throat neck yes. face area yeah and it's really gross. It's really gross and uncomfortable. Ought not to have happened. And it is, yep. yeah, intended to intimidate someone who, yeah, isn't present. Yeah, nope, not and cool. Who we have no reason to believe can actually see what's happening mm -hmm. anyway. So it's just him, yeah, really grossly assaulting a woman. Yeah. Who's there as a messenger to the extent that she's, you know, there at all. Mm -hmm. It's really tough. Agreed. It made you feel gross about the yeah, movie. I know it did. Yeah, we talked absolutely. about that after no. you watched it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Back with Viola Davis, June is shown the footage of Roy planting the Zephyr on her in the Wichita airport right. so that she could go through security, then recovering it afterwards, mm -hmm. which, yeah, we could have figured out that that is, we, sure. we did in fact figure out that that is what was happening. There's a couple of moments in this film where it really doesn't trust the audience to be paying attention right. at all. Yeah. This is one of them. Like, we do not need to see this. We do not need to be shown it. It's very clear. And frankly, June is smart enough to have figured it out at this point, <laughs> too. And then it takes 45 minutes in his parents' house before she realizes what is so abundantly obvious to everyone. Yeah. That these are Roy's folks. Yes. Like, 
weird insecurity on the part of the script there, yeah. I think. Either yeah. that or it thinks that it's way cleverer than it is and that there's no way we can anticipate this move. Convinced now that she has been on the wrong side all along or that Roy is on the wrong side. Or some, some... Someone somewhere is on the wrong side. <laughs> it doesn't really matter who. She goes back to the hotel room and then basically confronts him. He has that great moment of dropping the Zephyr, which is slowly getting hotter and hotter through the arc of the whole film. Uh -huh. He drops it into the ice bucket, which I really like. That was nice. Yeah. yeah. Even the bad CGI steam. She clicks the pen to summon the CIA, to summon right. Viola Davis's goons. In like 0.5 seconds. And he gets that moment of sincere disappointment that hurt more than i thought it would yeah that moment when he he knows exactly what's going on because of course he does because he's roy miller's super spy yeah but the fact that it happens really hits him how does that work for you i i don't know that it's justified by the rest of the film but i would love to know how that moment plays for you uh it all went too fast after the clicking of the pen sure uh we needed a second more i think and then he disappears so effectively that it's too much like a magic trick. It's a real it's Batman too, vanish, it, isn't it? It really it? is. Yeah. yeah, it's just too much. So, but I agree. It's nice. That Which hurt more than I thought it would. He also does, after leaving the train, when uh, Peter Sarsgaard finds the, the little circle that's been drawn on the window. And when he squints down to look through it, he sees Roy. Who yes. then, yeah, Batman vanishes into yeah, the crowd. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird moment. We then get this extended chase sequence across the rooftops of Salzburg, which looks just Looks great. And Tom beautiful. Cruise running. yes. It's, it's unfortunate that because he's running on the rooftops, he's using this like stutter step. It's not sure. like the full it's Tom the Cruise full run. robo run, yeah, right? That's it's true. not like you are now an unstoppable force. <laughs> you, you are primal and atomic. You yeah. are run, right? We don't quite get that, but it's still very impressive. And then the sequence when he is finally apprehended and shot and drops into the water, mm -hmm. I think is beautifully shot. Yeah, it's good. Really, really good looking sequence. And uh, that's the end of the movie. <laughs> because we then cut through what would normally be at the end of the movie. We yeah. cut through June being debriefed and returning home. We get the flight. We get the wedding. The whole wedding unfolds. Despite when you point toward an event like this, you imply that that event is going to be significant in the film. At least yeah. it might even be the climax. It but also no, seems like happens. any amount of time could have passed. Like it could have been a week and a half. And yet it must have been, what, three days for the From whole movie? the beginning of the movie? Yeah. yeah. It, it must be about three days, yes. Wild. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that strange? It seems just so bizarre to me. Yes. Yeah. So we move through the wedding. We go to her repair shop where we get to see the sure. GTO. We get to have this brief conversation with the guy that she hires to work on cars in the dead of night. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Not entirely sure what's happening here. And then, yeah, she uh, she takes off. She remembers what she saw on Roy's phone. She drives out to investigate, which does give Diaz a chance to do some really cool driving here. One of the things that connects Diaz and Cruz as they are making this film, actually connected them back when they were working on Vanilla Sky, is that they both love driving in real life. They are oh. both like real petrol heads. They absolutely love driving fast cars, particularly American muscle cars. So it's really great that, that Diaz gets the chance to do a lot of that in this part yeah, of the film. And, and really cool. manages to sell it, I think. Her yeah. interesting little little maneuver to to shake her pursuit and, and get on the highway is sure. yeah, strong and That's stuff. right. You told me that they were on Top Gear together for this. They right? did. I wasn't able yeah. to track it down I bet you so that we could watch yeah. it before we recorded this podcast episode. But yes, they me. appeared on the British TV show Top Gear in the segment Star in a Reasonably Priced Car, <laughs> where they get into, I don't even remember, it's, it's a Sonata or something. I, I, and they yeah. drive it at speed around a disused airfield somewhere in the Midlands. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> which is maybe like the most British statement I've yeah. ever made. But yes, it's it's a pretty charming Cute. segment on a show that has some real bad politics, uh, uh, but, you know, mm. can be fun at least. Uh, yeah, but very capable. And it's nice to see June taking control of the story, at least, even though this is kind of ill-conceived and right. just kind of heavy-handed. Yeah, Because yeah. when she arrives at his parents' house, of course, she gets sprayed by the sprinkler because she literally cannot do anything <laughs> right. Yeah. She lies to get inside of the house. They take mm -hmm. her in to dry her off and tell her all about their weird good fortune. And then, of course, about their son who died in the Gulf War and an entire shelf dedicated, a, a little shrine to a cruise. Shrine to right cruise. there. Yeah. With little Eagle Scout weird DH CGI something. There's something so strange about that picture. It's not oh, just it? a picture of Cruz as a kid. Yeah. It's so weird looking. Mm. And it's, yeah, just another example of the CGI in this film not living up not working. to what is needed. What do you think of this idea? Uh, trying to step back and zoom out a little bit. What do you think of the idea that his parents are just having this kind of, I don't know, tragic, yes, but also kind of charmed life, you know? 
Is there anything? Is there anything gritty here? Is there anything? No, good there here, there really? could have been if we had. It's such an afterthought. We're yeah. so far into the film. It's you know we're just now getting to the name night, and so you yeah. want it to like mean <laughs> more. You want it to have been there the whole time. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's. it's to me, it feels a little half baked. We do get the very important exposition too that he was a world class swimmer. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Which is enough. He can to con- hold his breath for basically forever. <laughs> Which is enough to convince June that he did not, in fact, He's die in the river that. in Salzburg after being shot. Which is like, true. Holding you know, his was right. breath was not the issue there. <laughs> it was the getting shot. It I was think. the getting shot part. Yes. More. Yeah. She calls, her, this is a great sequence, I think. She calls her own machine at home to leave a message knowing that people will be listening in. Yes. Claiming that she has the Zephyr, which she does not have. Right. <laughs> so that they will come and confront her. She is effectively putting herself in danger so that Roy will come back from the dead to rescue her. Uh, which, which is, works. Which works. Brilliant. But you know what's great? <laughs> I think it's accidental. He's not watching her. He is surprised when he realizes that she is in Andalusia. When that she is, is true. That is I true. I think that yeah. moment is really great. We get this, just this look on Cruz's face. I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. How did this happen? Yeah. And I like and then that. And when she's like, you don't seem happy to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite moment? Yeah, let's get to it. <laughs> she's taken to Spain. Antonio, the weapons dealer, uh, drugs her with this experimental truth serum that makes her tell the truth, makes sure. her incredibly charming, makes her kind of horny. Yep. It's a good yep. comedy, and I think that Diaz plays this just beautifully. He's really enjoying being a motor mouth in this yeah. part of the movie, which is just <laughs> fantastic. She tells Antonio that she feels so powerful and capable around Roy, which I, I don't know why I she don't know would, why, but, but he also takes care of her, which is very important. Yeah, right? That's clearly sure. a thing that means a lot to mm-hmm. her because of daddy issues. <laughs> Fitzgerald arranges a meeting by the river with Antonio, but Roy, who is watching from the rooftop, sees June and then Batman's away the guard. I'm yes, using Batman, Batman as yeah. a verb a lot. Well, that's he, what he Batman's does. Away the he really does. Yeah. Using just like a rope. Just right? a rope they found. <laughs> it's not anything special. <laughs> He's just lassoing these guards. <laughs> Yep. One by one. It's like a Hitman level. It you is. know that video game Hitman I, where you go through and coordinate your your <laughs> super painstaking assassinations of people? That is exactly what is happening oh, here. Man. He then delivers a message and escapes with June, who, yeah, I, straight up makes so much more sense as this version of June than any sure. other version of June that we get in the entire thing. And then we get, is it the sexiest shot in a Tom Cruise movie to date? This moment where he turns away, walks through the gunfire, mm-hmm. and not like quickly with like a real purpose it is like an antonio banderas move it is that kind of maybe that's coming to mind just because we're in spain at this moment but it is like a real swaggering kind of sexy it's cool yeah and then he kisses her is this the hottest cruise has ever been maybe for me yeah Yeah. i think possibly so i could say it It works for me to him being he's coming into his looks i'm i'm not boyish doesn't usually do it for me so to have him be a little bit more adult a little bit more filled out Yes. I like. Yes. Yeah. No, and that, again, yeah, we're echoing this idea that this is a, a grown up movie for right? grown ups. Yeah. And that's a thing to be applauded, even when it is this you know, patchwork, let's say. <laughs> Cut to a chase sequence through the streets, then add in the running of the CGI bulls. Oh my God. That's not a, motorcycling with the bulls. That's not a long standing tradition, but really, you, you have to see the running of the CGI bulls. It's, it's so <laughs> impressive and brilliantly gets more impressive every year They're as the technology improves. So huge. It's they were so much bigger so than cars. So stupid and looks like garbage. It looks and like garbage. Just, and then why pop a wheelie? <laughs> why do anything that we're doing in this sequence uh, except for him maneuvering June around so that she is sitting astride him? This is like the sure. cover shot that we get yeah. on the new release of the DVD. And he's praising her as she is casually murdering people. God. But it's great because she's astride Tom Cruise, who is astride a motorcycle, and her daddy is validating her, and it's all working out for the best. <laughs> Wow. Is this a, a lot fair of reading? Happening. Do you think that I do. this is a fair reading? I do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't seen it, but I see it now. Yeah. Roy jumps off a bridge, then swings onto a boat and confronts Fitzgerald. He gives him the right, battery, right. which is deteriorating rapidly. Mm-hmm. It explodes in the sky. Basically, off screen, it kills Sarsgaard. Right. As I said, the entire plot is resolved by this small device. Basically. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Except that our boy is shot. It turns out Except that Roy took fine? the bullet intended for Simon, and we get the reversal of the previous impressionistic montage, except mm-hmm. now it is Roy being taken care of by June. And I would maybe like this if it wasn't just an echo, just an inversion, yeah. if it wasn't just 
I don't know, rendering him as helpless as she was rendered earlier in the story, which I didn't like when it happened to her. I don't like when it happens to him. And then when we come out of it so that they can literally repeat the entire script of the film to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Not great. Like, I understand why this is here, Mm -hmm. but this is not this is not it, you guys. (laughs) Yeah. Disappointing in that in that final moment, but yeah. also a little bit cute, like a little bit like they just get to ride off together into the <laughs> South Americas. Yeah, no, like, I love this this beach scene where she's like, "Yeah, we're going to Cape Horn. It's going to be great." <laughs> and we're like, "Ooh, tropical vacation, fantastic!" But it's Cape 3, Horn 000. is freezing cold, you guys. It is <laughs> basically the Antarctic Circle. Penguins <laughs> live there. <laughs> yes, but the sign does say it's three thousand yes, miles away, I so know, they're not close but we're yet. We're having this like. <laughs> GTO sun-soaked road trip vision of the future that's happening here. And then we cap it all with the weirdest beat in the entire film. His parents, which we shoot from outside because we clearly did not shoot this in principal photography. This was a some tacked on little addendum in the editing oh, suite, I'm sure. sure. The moment where the parents learn that they have won tickets to Cape Horn. What the hell is that? I guess. What is going to happen? <laughs> Are they going to be reunited? Because they really shouldn't be. Maybe Particularly if not he's... 3,000 miles away from the closest therapist. <laughs> I was just thinking that maybe if he is going to be like off the radar and can't be found by Viola Davis and the CIA and whomever, then maybe they're just going to have a sweet little destination wedding and <laughs> build a little house where they live together in that multi-generational sort of way. And I don't know. They've got that publisher's clearinghouse money for sure. They They've could do got it. it. <laughs> I don't know what property is going for in Cape Horn now. <laughs> so weird. We just released the bonus episode over on the Patreon page, patreon.com slash next word on Master and Commander, the far side of the world. So good. Which features prominently Cape Horn. Yeah. And it's strange that the way that looking these... Freezing cold. Looking right. freezing like, cold. Yes, actually froze kidding. the it's boat into icicles. Cold. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that is night and day mm. weirdly didn't spawn a franchise weird o- odd that it didn't i mean but you know if it, if they'd figured their shit out and had worked i would have loved it there's so much here to like i don't know that even the best possible version of this story it feels very self-contained this is the kind of thing where you know we, we could have gone back to the golden age of hollywood and i would have watched three more movies with cameron diaz and tom cruise in various permutations oh where right? it's all a little bit the same but a little bit it's different. all a little bit yeah you know the yeah. chemistry they you know, just it's, like it's file off the serial Bacall, numbers or right? whatever like yeah you yeah, going, yeah. You, you love this chemistry so much that you just watch it in different ways in different permutations yeah i don't know that this story has legs for a sequel let alone yeah. the start of a yeah, franchise that's fair but again here we are at the end of the discussion and there's so much to like about this very stupid film <laughs> yeah I, I have fun. No I have laughed this hard through a podcast. <laughs> like my cheeks hurt. That's true, actually. I, I, I don't remember the last time we had, yeah, fun talking about <laughs> Tom Cruise. A lot of these movies lately have kind of been worse. <laughs> Not fun. Yeah. And this so one, true. yeah, is at least real dumb, mm-hmm. and and all the more fun for that. So Agreed. it's hard to give it a recommendation. I have no idea where we're going to put this on yeah, the list the of list. every Tom Cruise movie ever. Uh, I'm thinking somewhere around, you know, Mission Impossible third on the list, like really <laughs> unimpeachable <laughs> classic. I mean, what jumps out to you? Is there anything on oh, this list man. that is comparable? I mean, I mentioned the connection with Risky Business, which right. is all the way down at number 22 on our list. Yeah. And it's not actually that much like Risky Business. It's not, but but cocktails under that, and it feels a little bit cocktail-y too. Like how many movies are we making in this one right. movie? And some of the movies that we're making I like, and some but, of the movies that we're making I don't like at all. And wow, can you true. get your tone under control? But no, that's you can't. the bottom third of the list, and I just think that on some level this film is better than that. <laughs> Interesting, sure. I think you're right. I think there's a difference between, I don't know, a specific technical judgment here mm-hmm. and... And a gut feeling, right? Sure. Let's just go on vibes. Just on vibes, where do you put this? How likely are you to watch this before you watch Vanilla Sky again? Or before you watch Collateral again? Or before you watch Valkyrie again? Oh, man. (laughs) Uh, That would put it somewhere around like Far and Away and Eyes Wide Shut, which are 17 and 18. That seems appropriate to me Does that Putting feel it right? just under vanilla sky is not the craziest thing that I've that ever would heard. make a lot of sense just right? under vanilla sky just under yes. vanilla sky ahead of far and away yeah far and away also kind of a hot mess of a film that doesn't yes. really cohere but just in the way that it, i mean nothing the like highs are higher nothing like as hot or as messy as yes. night and day. Yes. 
<laughs> so yeah, I could see it going in there. The new number 17 on the list, basically the midpoint of the list. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. All right. That's where it's going, number 17 <laughs> on the list, right under Vanilla Sky, because where else would it go, honestly? <laughs> it has been such a pleasure talking about Cameron Diaz in the scope of this this series. Agreed. It's too yeah. bad we're not going to get, well, uh, not going to get another movie with her and Cruz yet. Maybe we will Who in knows? 2028 yeah. get that long-awaited night and day two daybreak. <laughs> Do we have any thoughts on the name? I said that we would circle back around to this right at the end of the discussion. Is there any kind of, have we shaken loose any possible interpretive moves oh, that we can make that that, that make the name work? meaning yeah i mean no it's just bad the night for most of the film is the stupid little burger king kids toy that right. he takes so that he can put the zephyr inside because those toys are also hollow i guess and easy to open that seems like a choking hazard right. for young children I and don't know. is it actually a burger king toy or is she no just idea. making the joke that it's a shitty little toy i, yeah. I don't know i have I don't no know. idea it's something that he picked up from the wichita airport so it could be anything <laughs> such as the wonder and mystery together. and magic of the wichita airport mm-hmm. yeah that's the night for most of it and the day you're right someday is the kind of obvious most applicable reference that the yeah. film uses but Weak, really bad, yes. honestly. And if you're going to rewrite it this much, maybe do one more pass and give it a better name. <laughs> Can you right now, spontaneously, while I go into the blurb about the Patreon, think of a better name for this movie? Everything that we do here at Next Word is possible thanks to you guys. Elizabeth is staring at me, her eyes as wide as they have ever been. <laughs> We are so grateful for your support. Podcasting takes a lot of time. Sometimes we have to watch a movie. Sometimes we have to watch two. Sometimes we have to talk about it here for an hour and a half, which is probably more time than anyone has spent discussing Night and Day since it was in the very earliest stages of its production. We are so grateful to you for all of your support. If you pledge your support over at patreon.com slash next word, you get access to all of our many and varied bonus episodes, including that aforementioned discussion of Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, which was so much fun to talk about. Yes. What a great movie. Really great. I had an absolute blast talking about that. We have talked about Boogie Nights. We have talked about Dirty Dancing. We have talked about Bridget Jones, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. We've really covered every possible That was a fun episode. That was a two martini episode. all been a blast. (laughs) over there on the Patreon. (laughs) Patreon Patreon.com slash next word. Elizabeth, would you like to thank our superstar patrons? I would indeed. Thank you, Leslie Skipa, Louise in Dallas, Megan Lauder, Phoebe, Art Kilmer, Kimberly Bear, Self on a Shelf, Jolene Stark, Chris Dons, and the Lady Gordon. We are so grateful. And you can come summer with us in Cape Horn anytime you like. We're we're just going to have a very (laughs) quiet home down there, far, far away from Viola Davis. That is going to do it for this week. And now we've tried everything else, so it is time to go back to the well. Intended to be the final chapter in the Mission Impossible series for Tom Cruise, a handoff to Jeremy Renner, of all people. We will see how it works out when we look at one of the undisputed high points in the Mission Impossible series, directed by one of my favorite directors, Mr. Brad Bird. Next week, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Next week, we're doing the Ghost Pro. It's going to be fun. (laughs) I'm so glad you finally get to talk about Brad Bird. (laughs) That is going to be an introduction to next week's podcast. Buckle up, you guys. Right. It's going to be a lecture. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Get a cup of tea. Get a cup of tea. Find a cozy spot. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) It's going to be a really fun discussion. And I do think... Yeah, one of my favorite of the Mission Impossible. I mean, basically every Mission Impossible movie from this point on is properly good, is going to be my assertion. I think that Ghost Protocol is good. Rogue Nation yeah. is good. Fallout is terrific. Yeah. So we've got a lot to look forward to in that series as we cover the last 12 movies in Gosh. Tom Cruise's filmography. We'll be back next week with Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Until then, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>